بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله خير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Our lecture today is on the life and the creed of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullahu ta'ala Now when we look at the Muslim ummah we see that the entire Muslim Ummah ascribes to four men in terms of the understanding, the fiqh, the jurisprudence of the religion. And these four men, these four great men, in Arabic we say Al-A'immat Al-Arba, the four Imams, we see that each of them, they strove to derive the rulings from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah, the rulings that relate to the ibadat, the actions of worship, and the rulings related to the mu'amalat, the mu'amalat, the dealings that we have with each other. So the ibadat, this is clear, that which relates to you and your Lord in terms of the worship, the affairs of worship, the tahara, the salah, the zakah, the hajj, the sawm, and so on and, and so forth. And likewise, the mu'amalat, the dealings that we have, the dealing of marriage, the dealing of contracts and trade and business, the dealing, the inheritance and so on and so forth. So in these issues, these imams, they strove to clarify the religion, the rulings of the religion for the people at large, and they laid down many, many great and important principles that help us to understand the religion and so we find that the people in the Ummah, they ascribe to one of these four Imams. So we have those who say that we are Hanafi, those who say that we are Maliki, those who say that we are Shafi'i, and those who, who say that we are Ham- Hanbali. And this is an ascription, when they make this ascription, this is an ascription, in almost all cases, to the fiqh, to the jurisprudence, to the understanding and the usul of these Imams, as it relates to how do they derive rulings from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. However, whilst this is an ascription to fiqh, in terms of fiqh, the jurisprudence, there's something which is even more fundamental and more important, which is that these imams, that these four imams were also united and agreed overwhelmingly and almost in everything, in the issues of aqidah. And this is something even more important. The, the issue of fiqh is something that is a branch, that branches off from the affairs of tawheed and iman and aqidah. And so when we look at these imams from the point of view of the actual aqidah, the, the, the creed that they were upon, this is something that all Muslims should investigate and look at because they will find that these imams in just about almost everything were actually united in the usul, in the usul of the religion. The usul, when we say the usul, when we use this word usul din we have to be very clear what we mean by this word, because this word is used by different parties and different groups to mean something else. So the word usul and usul din when we speak of the foundations of the religion, this refers to the six pillars of iman, the six pillars of iman. This is how it is understood with Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah when we use this word, Usul din It is to believe in Allah and His name and His, his uh, angels and His books and His messengers, the last day and Al Qadr, it's good and it's evil. So, this is how we understand Usul din There's another usage of the word Usul din foundations of the, of, of the religion. This is an innovated. It is a newly invented understanding of Usul al-Din. It was not known, it was not taught by the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
It was not known by any of the Sahaba. It was not known by any of the Tabi'een, nor was it known by any of the Tabi' Tabi'een. This understanding of Usuluddin is the understanding with the people of Kalam, the people of Kalam, Ilmul Kalam. And they claim, they say that the Usuluddin refers here to primarily establishing and proving Allah's existence by way of reason, by way of rational proofs. That this is the foundation of Usuluddin. And then following on from this to prove and establish the prophethood, and then after this follow on other, other affairs. So these people who built their religion upon this ilmul kalam, when they use the word usuluddin, this is what they mean. And this is different to what is meant and understood by the, the, the people of the sunnah. The people of the sunnah, it is the six pillars of iman. So the point that we are making here at the very beginning is that the, that the, that the four imams, they were united in the usuluddin, meaning in terms of what they believed with respect to Allah and his tawheed and his names and his attributes and his angels and books and messengers and the last day and al-qadr, it's good and it's evil. They were, uni they were united in all of these affairs. So for that reason, when we speak of any imam, when we speak of any imam, whether it be Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Malik, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, that, that which we look at first and foremost is his creed, is his, is his aqidah. Because as we said, all of them were united in following the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And for that reason, before we continue, we should mention that when we look at the creed of all of these imams, we can broadly, and the usul, the foundations, we can broadly summarize their da'wah into three important principles, which if every Muslim in every part of the world was to adhere to, and which if they were to identify in each of these imams, it would be a great source of unity for the whole ummah. And those three foundational principles are, number one, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Number two, uh, al-ittiba, which is following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallam. And thirdly, following the understanding of the sahaba, or the understanding of the salaf. All of these imams, that's, that's what they were actually pursuing. That's what they were upon. This was the foundation of their entire religion. As for the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is to single out Allah, ifradullahi bil ibadah. To single out Allah, in every form and type of worship, meaning to direct worship only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is because this naturally follows on from our belief and our conviction that there is no creator, no provider, no sustainer, no one who gives life, no one who takes life, no one who provides benefit, no one who repels harm, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a a conviction that every person, in fact, every person is born upon this. This is called the fitra. This is called the, the natural disposition upon which everybody is born upon. Whether he be, you know, whether he born, be born to Jews or Christians or non-Muslims or whatever. Every person is born upon this uh, inherent conviction that there is a Lord and he creates, provides, owns, sustains, gives life, takes life. Bene uh, gives benefit, repels harm. So this is something natural. So this tawheed is something that follows on from that conviction, which is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore should be called upon, should be prostrated to, should be bowed to, should be sacrificed for, should be hoped and loved and feared with a hope and a love and a fear that is uh, specifically for, hi for him alone. This is the tawheed that is the first and the mightiest principle of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what these imams, that's what they were upon. They were united upon this as we shall see from some of the statements later on. The second principle is the sunnah, following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sunnah is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something which explains and clarifies the Qur'an. It explains and clarifies the rulings in the Qur'an. And the Qur'an cannot be understood except by way of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah 
And the proof of following the sunnah is evident in the Quran. There are many evidences. But here in terms of the principle, we see that all of these imams, when you look at their usul, you see that they refer back to the sunnah. And the third thing is the following of the sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, or those whom we call the, the salaf. Those who are the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'i Tabi'een, the thir- first three generations of the Muslims. In fact, Abu Hanifa himself, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Alika bil athar, Alika bil athar, upon you is to follow the, uh, the narration, the narration which comes from those who preceded, those who came first, meaning the Tabi'een and the Sahaba. Wa tariqat is salaf. So upon you is the athar and the path of the salaf. وَإِيَّاكَ وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ فَإِنَّهَا بِدْعَةٌ So he said, beware of every single newly invented affair. For verily it is an innovation. It is an innovation. So we see that this is something Abu Hanifa said, and he, was, he said, and he was the first of the four imams. He was born in 80 Hijra, the year 80 Hijra. And whenever we look at any of these imams, we have to understand and look at the circumstances in which they lived. This will give us a better understanding of this imam and many of his statements, many of his positions. So without understanding history, we will never really truly understand the reality of the, the, the person that we are speaking of. So Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was born in uh, the year 80 Hijrah. And by the year 80 Hijra, there were a number of different sects which had appeared. There were the Khawarij, the Khawarij, and the Rafida, the Shia. They were the first two sects to appear. And likewise, the Qadariya, those who denied Al Qadr. They had just appeared around that time, at the time that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, was born. And he lived for a period of 70 years. Rahimahullah, he died in the year 150 Hijra. This means that he was present at the time when in the second century, the group, the general overall group that we call the Ahlul Kalam, the Ahlul Kalam, the people of Kalam, when they appeared at the beginnings of the second century. And we mean here specifically the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila. The Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila. So they appeared in the direction of Iraq, from Iraq, in uh, various places in Iraq. And Abu Hanifa, he was in Iraq, he was born in Iraq, and he was present in Iraq. And so we have to understand all of these circumstances when we come to look at some of the views and positions uh, of Abu Hanifa a bit later on. So with this brief introduction, we're going to now look at the lineage of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and a bit about his birth and a bit about what led him to seeking knowledge and also what some of the scholars have said about him in praise of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. So his name, Abu Hanifa's name rahimahullah ta'ala, does anybody know Abu Hanifa's name? And Nu'man bin Thabit bin and Nu'man bin Thabit bin Zuta bin Zuta. So his kunya is Abu Hanifa, as we know, this is what he's famously known with. But his name is An Nu'man, the son of Thabit. His father's name is Thabit bin Zuta. Zuta is his grandfather's name and there are some other variations of the names given to his grandfather but this is the name that has been given to him and then after this there are a number of ascriptions so we have an numan bin thabit bin zuta at-taymi at-taymi is an ascription at-taymi to a tribe and al-kufi al-kufi is an ascription to the place where he where he was present, where he lived, where he resided, which is Kufa in Iraq. Now, this needs some explanation. It needs some explanation. So, what we need to understand 
is that his grandfather, his grandfather who is referred to as Zuta, he was from the people, it is said, of Kabul. Kabul, which is present-day Afghanistan, which in those days was known as, generally as Persia, as Faris. So his father used to be from the people of Kabul, and when the Arabs, when they uh, spread Islam, and obviously in those days they would, they would take uh, slaves. And so his grandfather, he was uh, taken like this by Banu Taym, Banu Taymillah, this was a tribe amongst the Arabs. Banu Taymillah bin Tha'laba. And what happened is that his grandfather became a Muslim. Zuta, he became a Muslim. And therefore he was freed. He was a freed slave. He was freed by the tribe. And then his son, Thabit, who is the father of Abu Hanifa, he was born upon Islam. So the grandfather was upon other than Islam. And then he accepted Islam. He was freed. And then his son Thabit was born upon Islam. And then his son, Abu Hani, uh, and Nu'man bin Thabit, then of course he was born uh, upon Islam. So this is the start of Islam in the, in the lineage of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. So what happened therefore is because Zuta, he remained with the tribe, the tribe of uh, Banu uh, Taym, his ascription therefore became a Taymi. So this is an ascription... Not because his lineage goes back to this tribe, but because he had allegiance to this tribe. So we need to distinguish that sometimes a person can be given a tribal name because of his allegiance to the tribe, not because he is from the descendants of that tribe. So here, when we say that Abu Hanifa is a Nu'man bin Thabit bin Zuta at Taymi, it means a Taymi by way of allegiance to the tribe of Banu Taymillah. That should be, so we should be very clear about that. Now, as for his father, his father used to sell silk. He used to sell silk. And he used to also have a shop selling garments. And he used to, his father used to earn a halal living by way of selling uh, silk. And... Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he took this profession, he took this profession from his uh, father, and he himself was uh, born in Kufa, and the family, now of course the family had already accepted Islam as we mentioned, and so his father, uh, his family was a, a righteous uh, family, a fairly well-off family, and a noble family. And Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he followed the profession of his father, so he entered into the same trade, into the same business, and he would, was like uh, someone who traded in silk, and he would also sell garments, and he had a shop, his father had a shop in uh, Kufa. And Abu Hanifa, Allah Ta'ala, he used to uh, be involved in his father's trade, and he displayed a great level of amana and sidq. Amana and sidq. Trustworthiness and honesty. We can give one or two examples of this, which are narrated about Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. One of the examples which is mentioned about him is that once he went to buy a garment, a thobe, from a woman, a woman uh, trader. And so she offered to sell it at 100 dirhams. So Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, increase it in price. So she said, okay, 200 dirhams. So then he said, no, increase it more in price. So she goes, are you sure? He said, yes. So she said, 300 dirhams. Then he said, no, increase it more in price. So she said, 400 dirhams. And then he said, no, increase it more. And she goes, are you sure? And then he said, then he said okay, go and bring me, go and bring me a, another tailor, someone who's nearby. So then another tailor came by. And he said to her, ask this man what this, what, what this uh, thobe is worth. So the man looked at it and he said, this is, this is 500 dirhams. This is worth 500 dirhams. So then Abu Hanif, he gave the woman 500 dirhams to, to purchase the, the actual thobe. Now what, is, what does this tell you? This tells you that Abu Hanif, he knew that the woman was underselling the garment by a great deal. Much less than what it was actually worth. 
So from his honesty, untrustworthiness, rather, rather than you know, finding a bargain, he actually paid the actual price for what the, what the garment is worth, and he informed the woman of that as well. That's one example mentioned. A second example mentioned is that he was selling a garment to a lady, and he was going to sell it for four dirhams. Four dirhams, which is absolutely nothing. So the woman said, this, this is not right, this cannot be right. This is absolutely not right. This is not right. And so Abu Hanifa, he said, he said, that the reason why it's four dirhams is because I bought two garments. I bought two garments. The first one which I sold, I managed to get all of the, the, my capital back and whatever is on top of that. I managed to get everything back and whatever is on top of that. Except for four dirhams. So in other words, I was four dirhams short on the, in, on, on, on the trade and profit, whatever else, from the first garment. So therefore, I'm selling the second garment only for four dirhams. So he sold the garment for four dirhams. Which, what this tells you here really is that Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah, he's maintaining a reasonable amount of, of profit and trade on whatever he's selling, meaning, you know, he's not raising the profit to such an, uh, a degree, even though it might be possible, but he's remaining within that which is uh, uh, that which is reasonable and that which is acceptable, and not going beyond beyond, beyond that. So these are examples that, that are given about Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah, as a as a businessman, which shows his amana and his sidq, his truthfulness and his his honesty. So one day when he was going to the market, he was going to the market one day, and he met a great scholar and a great imam by the name of Ash-Sha'bi. Ash-Sha'bi rahimahullah ta'ala, his name is Amir bin Shirahil, Amir bin Shirahil al-Hamadani, known as Ash-Sha'bi. Ash-Sha'bi rahimahullah ta'ala was born in the year 21 Hijra. So he, he was born literally... Um, uh, six, or almost 60 years before Abu Hanifa ta'ala. and he was someone who took knowledge from the Sahaba he took knowledge from Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu he took knowledge from Aisha radiyallahu anha he took knowledge from uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu and many other Sahaba so he met a Sha'bi and a Sha'bi said to him uh, Shabi was sitting and he called Abu Hanifa over and he said, he said, where are you, where are you off to? Where are you, where are you going to? He said, well, I'm off to the market. I'm off to the market and I'm going to see my teacher. And by teacher he meant the one who is teaching him the trade, the trade. And so he said, he said, uh, I didn't ask you about you know, the market, I'm asking you, where are you going to, who are you going to from the scholars, from the ulama, from the actual scholars of the religion? And he said, well, I don't really spend much time with them. I don't really frequent them that often. And so Ash-Sha'bi said to him, Ash-Sha'bi said to him, don't do that. Rather, you should look into knowledge. وَعَلَيْكَ بِالنَّظَرْ فِي الْعِلْمِ Upon you is to look into knowledge and to sit amongst the scholars to sit amongst the scholars. For indeed, فَإِنِّي أَرَافِيكَ يَقْذَةً وَحَرَكَةً For indeed, I see amongst you, I, 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 see among, I see within you, I see that you are someone who is quite uh, perceptive. You are alert. And you also have a great deal of uh, activity. You have a great deal of zig and vigor and, and activity. So upon you is to go and sit with the scholars and to seek the knowledge. So when Abu Hanifa, when he heard this, he said, فَوَقَعَ فِي قَلْبِ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ فَتَرَقْتُ الْإِخْتِلَافِ إِلَى السُّوكِ وَأَخَذْتُ فِي الْعِلْمِ فَنَفَعَنِي اللَّهُ بِقَوْلِهِ He said, so what happened is in my heart, his, his speech, it entered into my heart, it affected my heart. And I abandoned frequenting the, the, the market, and then I began to take knowledge. And Allah, he benefited me, by way of this. So this is the starting point of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala in him seeking the knowledge. 
So in the first part of his life, now this is really at the early part of his life, very, uh, this is, you know, barely reaching his 20s at this stage. And so he went and he began to seek knowledge in certain areas, first of all, in the knowledge of Arabic grammar. He sought knowledge uh, of Arabic grammar. And then, now because he was living in Kufa, he was living in Kufa, and that's why I said to you at the beginning, that when we speak about people and the biographies, we have to understand the circumstances in which, they, in which they live. So when he sought knowledge at the very beginning, he learned Arabic grammar. He also, because there were many in, in that period, in that early period in Kufa, it was the starting point of when there began to be many uh, debates and discussions and arguments with different types of groups and parties, with the Qadariyya, where there used to be a group of Hindus called the Sumaniya, and we're going to mention a narration about them a bit later on, inshallah ta'ala. So he entered into uh, debating with the people of misguidance and the atheists and other than them. And he became quite skilled in that regard, and he uh, became quite skilled. And it is also mentioned that he also debated and, and argued with Jaham bin Safwan. Jaham bin Safwan is the founder of the Jahmiya, those people who entered upon the, the Ilmul Kalam and speaking about Allah's attributes and so on and so forth. So he refuted the Mu'tazila, uh, you know, the, when the Mu'tazila appeared later on in his life, he re- spoke about them, refuted the Khawarij, refuted the, the atheists, likewise the extremist uh, the Shia, the Rafida. So he was involved in this for an initial part of his life. So then what happened is, he then uh, turned towards seeking knowledge of fiqh. And the reason why that happened was because a woman came to him, and she asked him a question regarding divorce. And he didn't know the answer. He didn't know the answer. So he said to her, go to this man, and there was a man, another alim called Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman. he was a faqih, and so he said, go and ask Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman. and when you've, when you've asked him and he gives you the answer, then come, and, come back and tell me the answer. So what happened is that the woman had a question about di- uh, divorce, and so she went and asked Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, and then she came back to Abu Hanifa and said that this was the answer he gave, that basically... Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a certain uh, period of time after the divorce is pronounced. So she told him the answer, and then Abu Hanifa realized that I don't really have any understanding of the, in these affairs, so therefore I need to turn towards fiqh. So the early part of his life, he was involved in arguing, debating, refuting the people of, of you know, the people who were present in his time, and then he turned towards seeking fiqh in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is when he realized that he needs to spend time with Hamad bin Abi Suleiman rahimahullah ta'ala. Now Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, he was a sheikh from the sheikhs of uh, Kufa, he was a jurist. And Abu Hanifa spent 18 years in total with him. Spent 18 years sitting with him almost every single day, visiting, visiting, him, visiting him in his house and having a great deal of uh, respect for him. Now, Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, before we go any further, that's why I keep saying to you that we have to keep history in mind. Who is Hamad bin Abi Suleiman? Hamad bin Abi Suleiman is from those people who began to speak about what became known later as Al Irja. Al Irja. Al Irja is one of the Four innovations, four main innovations which appeared in the first century of Islam. There were the Khawarij, then there was the Rafida, then there was the Qadariya, then there was the Murji'a. And the Murji'a are those who held a certain view with respect to Iman. What is the reality of Iman? What is the nature of Iman? Faith. And Hamad bin Abi Suleiman was one of the first people to speak with this which is, which is an innovation. And the reason why this happened was because of the following. First of all, number one, 
is that as you know the Khawarij when they appeared they began to declare the Muslims to be disbelievers those who committed a major sin so a Muslim for example who fell into a major sin maybe he drank or maybe he lied or maybe he stole or maybe he did something that was a major sin so the Khawarij they said that anyone who falls into a major sin then he has committed kufr and therefore he will abide in the hellfire forever now obviously this saying is, is batil it is false and so in response to this these jurists from kufa those who were present in kufa when they responded to this innovation they responded responded to this innovation in something with something which was also incorrect so they reasoned in their minds they said well if the Khawarij are saying that a person who commits a major sin, so he falls into a major sin, or he abandons an obligation, and if they are saying that he becomes a disbeliever, this can't, this, we know this is not correct, this can't be right. This must mean, therefore, that actions cannot be from Iman. Actions cannot be from faith. And if we say that actions are not from Iman, we have therefore answered the problem of the Khawarij. Because now if the Khawarij say a man who sins, then we know he can't be a disbeliever because sinning and avoiding sin is not actually from Iman. Iman is just something what's in the heart and what's expressed by way of the tongue. So they expelled actions from the reality of Iman as a means of answering the bid'ah of the Khawarij. And this is a mistake. This is, this is a, a mistake. Because in the view of Ahlul Sunnah as a whole, all of the, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi Tabi'een, they are agreed that Iman or faith, it consists of belief in the heart and speech upon the tongue and actions of the limbs. All of these, come; they are, they are within the circle of Iman. We can't take any of these three things outside the circle of Iman. So what, what Hamad bin Abi Suleiman and those jurists from Kufa, what they did, the Fuqaha from Kufa, they made a mistake in this regard and they took Iman and they took it outside of the circle of, uh, the, the, they took action, sorry, the A'mal, the actions, and they took it outside the circle of Iman and they put them outside here. So now if a person commits a major sin or they keep away from an obligation, it doesn't matter because they, they won't become a disbeliever. Now this is true, but it's true for the wrong reason. It's true for the wrong reason. The reason why they are not disbelievers is because their iman, although it has decreased, it hasn't been invalidated. It hasn't been negated. This is the correct position. That a person who commits a major sin, his iman has decreased and diminished. He's a weak believer. He's weak in his faith. But his iman is still present. Okay? So, so, the teacher of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was upon this mistake in the field of Iman. And for that reason, this mistake carried through and continued amongst the, 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 amongst the Hanafis from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, to his students. And then when we see Imam al-Tahawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he came in the 3rd and 4th century, we see that this carried through amongst the, the, the Hanafis. And then likewise today when we see the Maturidis and other than them, they maintain they are still upon this particular, uh, you know, uh, you know th this mistake. So, so this is something that we need to be uh, aware of with respect to uh, the teacher of Abu Hanifa, Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, rahimahullah ta'ala. So when he turned to this fiqh, then he turned towards uh, the... At the age of 20, 21 years old, he turned towards this fiqh and he studied with Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, as we said. And with respect to this, it is said about Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, the, the things which I mentioned about him, that he excelled in this fiqh. That when he entered into fiqh, he would sit with Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, he would memorize everything that Hamad bin Abi Suleiman used to say. So he'd, he, he would memorize his statement, and he'd come, he would come the next day, and he'd have the thing memorized. And when Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman saw this in Abu Hanifa, he would make him, and make him sit in front of the, the gathering, as, as opposed to anybody else. He would sit in front. So this went on for 18 or 20 or so years. And then when Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, when he passed away, 
Then Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah, he took his position, and so he became the faqih of the whole city, and eventually the whole country, people would travel to him to seek uh, the knowledge of fiqh. Now the scholars have praised him and mentioned things about him. Uh, we shall come to those in a short while, inshallah ta'ala. But if we look at his teachers and his students, as we said, his main teacher was Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, but there was also many of the tabi'een, many of the major tabi'een that were from his teachers. From them is Ata bin Abi Rabah. Ata bin Abi Rabah. And likewise, Ikrimah. Ikrimah. These are, these are students of the Sahaba from whom he took uh, knowledge. Likewise, Nafi' and Amr bin Dinar and Katada bin Da'ama and Mansur bin al Mu'tamar. And all of these are, these are from the major ones amongst the Tabi'een. I'll mention them again. Ata bin Abi Rabah, Ikrima, Nafi', Amr bin Dinar, Katada, and other than them. As for the students of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, from his students are Abu Yusuf, Abu Yusuf the Qadi, no, Ya'qub Abu Yusuf al Qadi, al Qadi Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, Zufar bin al Hudayl, and Nuh, Nuh bin Abi Maryam. Muhammad bin al Hassan al Shaybani. And there are also some famous scholars. Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala, was a student. He took knowledge from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. Mis'ar bin Kidam. Mis'ar bin Kidam. These are from the, the Muhaddithin. And likewise, Abu Bakr bin Ayyash. Abu Bakr bin Ayyash. He took knowledge from Abu Hanifa. And likewise, the famous Imam Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. Abdullah ibn al Mubarak is a famous Imam amongst the Imams of the Salaf, he took knowledge from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, as well. Abu Ishaq al-Fazari and Waqi' Waqi' who is the teacher of Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala. So we see that all of these are from the uh, students of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. This now leads us to the, pre the scholars who have spoken of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala first of all al khatib al baghdadi al khatib al baghdadi he said imam ashab al ra'i wa faqihi ahli al iraq that he is the imam of the people of ra'i we shall explain what this means in a short while inshallah ta'ala the imam of the people of ra'i and the faqih the jurist of the people of iraq the jurist of the people of iraq and likewise ibn kathir rahimahullah ta'ala he said faqih al iraq that he is the jurist of Iraq. وَأَحَدْ أَئِمَّةِ Islam, And one of the leading imams of Islam. And from the notable leaders and one of the pillars amongst the scholars. This is, is, this is in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya. Likewise, Imam Al-Zahabi, he said about him, كَانَ مِنْ أَذْكِيَا بَنِي آدَمْ جَمَعَ الْفِقْحِ وَالْإِبَادَةِ وَالْوَرَعِ وَالسَّخَاءِ that he was from the very intelligent ones amongst the, the sons of Adam. And he gathered together fiqh and ibadah and the awe and piety and generosity. And as Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Anas fil fiqh iyalun ala Abi Hanifa. Imam al Shafi'i said that people, when it comes to fiqh, they are dependent upon Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. And Ibn Abdul Bar. He narrates from Abu Dawood as Sidistani that Abu Hanifa, he was an Imam. So all of these uh, scholars establish and mention, no doubt that in terms of fiqh, in terms of the jurisprudence, that Abu Hanifa was indeed an Imam from the Imams of the religion. We come now, there are many other statements uh, from the ulama, in, uh, which, which mention, which will come to them shortly. But we come now to a quotation from Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala. And in this quotation, there's an there's a important lesson for us. Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in his uh, book, uh, he says in his book, which is uh, the explanation of Al-Wasitiyya, he said that there was a group of uh, people called the Sumaniyya. A group of people called the Sumaniyya. Now these people are a group of Hindus. They are like a branch of Hindus from India. And they came to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. They came to Abu Hanifa. And 
they began to debate with him with respect to a creator, whether, they were, whether there's a creator, or not, a creator or not. And Abu Hanifa, as we've already established, was one of the very intelligent scholars. And he said, so they, they had an agreement and they, he made a promise that we will meet together and we will have a debate on this issue. So then they came, they came at this meeting place and then Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he came and he said to them, uh, they, they, they said to him, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? So he said to them, I'm right now, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of something that I, uh, that I saw. I'm thinking, thinking of a ship. And this ship is full of merchandise and food. It's full of merchandise and food. And I can see that it's coming and moving, uh, sailing and coming to a port. To a port. And then what's happening is that the goods and the merchandise are being removed off the ship. And then the ship is going again. And then it's coming back again with more merchandise and more goods, more food. And it's being taken off onto the port and then the ship is going again. And all of this is taking place without anyone steering the ship and nor any porters who are taking off the goods off the ship. This is what I'm thinking, thinking of right now in my mind. This is what I'm thinking of. So he put this to them. And so these Hindu... These Hindu uh, Sumaniya, they said to him, uh, they said to him, are you, are you really thinking of this in your, in your mind? Are you really thinking this is possible? And he said, yes. He said, yes, of course I am. And then they said to him, you, you have no aql. You are, you are a man with no intellect, with no aql. And they said, can it be understood that a, that a ship and a boat can come like this, be steered, and the goods and merchandise are taking off, and then it, then it goes again? He said, this is something that we, this is not understandable, which means that you don't have any intellect. So then he responded to them and he said to them, how can you not understand this? How can you not understand this example that I've just given to you? When at the same time, you understand and you think in your minds, in your minds, you are thinking of the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains, and the trees, and all of the animals, and all of the men, all of this, you are, you are thinking of this in your mind, that all of this is, is without a creator, without a maker. Right, how, so how can you, so what I'm thinking in my mind, is insignificant compared to what you are thinking in your mind, as to how the, the universe is operating, and how you see all these things around you, which, you are, which everything works in order and regulation, there are wisdoms in everything. So he basically put this across to them and said that you are the people who've lost your minds. You are the people who are, who are, who are def deficient in your minds. So when, when they got this answer, they knew, they knew that Abu Hanifa, he responded to them in the same way that they were trying to ridicule Abu Hanifa. So therefore they were unable to answer him. Because if, you, if you're using an argument against someone, and that argument is counter-argued against you in an even stronger way, you've got, you, you've got no answer. It's impossible for you to answer. So they knew that he had obviously uh, over, overwhelmed them. Now, this story, there's, a, there's, a, there's an amazing benefit in this story. You have to really pay attention to some benefits that we can take from this story. This story is crucial and important because we can see the difference between the argument of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala in establishing and proving a creator on the one hand because he's used an argument which is rooted in the Quran which is rooted in the Quran so the difference between the argument used by Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and the argument used by the people of Kalam the people of Kalam the Ilm al-Kalam, the, the, the Jahmiyyah, and the Mu'tazila, and the Ash'aris, and the Maturidis. Because the Maturidiyya, they ascribe themselves to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. But, their theology, the Aqeedah that they are upon, 
it is founded upon something that Abu Hanifa was not upon and was never upon. Right? So, Abu Hanifa, he argued, how did he argue? He used an evidence in which in the Quran we call it the evidence, Dalil, Dalilul Ikhtira. Dalilul Ikhtira and Dalilul Inayah. Right? These are, this is an evidence in the Quran for the existence of a creator. The evidence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala originating things and creating things and the evidence of Allah's perfection and uh, skill in, in the creation. So this argument used by Abu Hanifa was, was from this angle and it is taken from the Quran. Now, if you look at the people of Kalam, the Ahlul Kalam, the Ilmul Kalam, the Jahmiya, the Mu'tazila, the Ash'aris, the Maturidis, the Maturidis who ascribe themselves to Abu Hanifa, you will see that they have made, and remember at the beginning we spoke about something called the Usuluddin, the Usuluddin, right? So from their foundations of the religion is that they have used an argument to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which in its foundations, it goes all the way back to Aristotle. Aristotle is a Greek philosopher who was present before the time of Isa alayhi salam. 322 BC. So this man was a misguided star worshipper, an idolater, and he wrote much about the natural world and about you know many different sciences. And in his books, he also spoke about you know he he, he spoke about the existence of a first cause, and he used a certain language: bodies, accidents, ajsam, ma'arad. And all of this type of language, this is what came to the Muslims in the second century after Islam. This is what became the foundation of Ilmul Kalam. This is what Jahm bin Safwan and the Mu'tazila and later the Maturidis and the Ash'aris, they all began to use this baggage and this terminology and this science. They began to use it in debates and arguments. And then they used this language in order to construct a to create a way of arguing for the existence of a creator. Right? They use these, this language. And so this method, in, 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 uh, what, what they invented, is something that Jahm bin Safwan and the Mu'tazila, they are the ones who brought this method. And they began to debate against atheists, but in a way different to how Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, was, was arguing. Abu Hanifa took this method from the Qur'an. The Ahlul Kalam took their methods and their foundations from the philosophers, the Greek philosophers and other people uh, besides them. So in this story, this story, because we hear this story often, you will hear this story mentioned. Uh, who's heard this story before? Put your hand up if you've heard this story. Have you heard this story before? Yes, many people have heard this story before. This means that this story is, is known and widespread, but this is, there's an important lesson in this, in that we see that Abu Hanifa is unlike the people of Kalam who ascribe to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. And this story is an evidence and a proof of that. And then we see there are other narrations from some other scholars. For example, it was said to a Bedouin, it was said about a Bedouin, how do you know about your Lord? How do you know, how do you know your Lord exists? He said, he said that uh, tracks on the ground they are an evidence of the traveler. So traveling tracks on the ground, they are an evidence for the one who is traveling. And likewise, when you see the camel droppings in the, in the desert, they are an evidence of the camel. They are a direct evidence of the camel. And likewise, when you see the sky, and you see the valleys, and you see the oceans, all of these are evidence of the one who is as Samir al-Basir, right? So here, this is another type of evidence similar to the one that Abu Hanifa used. And all of this is different to the philosophical, the philosophical, the deep, you know, the long-winded, complicated methods that nobody even understands. Nobody even understands those methods which are used by the Ahlul Kalam, the people of Kalam, what you find in the books of the Ash'aris, what you find in the books of the Maturidis, right? 
all this, you know, if, if you were to start using this word, you wouldn't know what, what on earth is, is going on. You know, the, there are attributes in, in bodies, and attributes always come after uh, bodies, and therefore that means the bodies are hawadith, and hawadith means that they came... This language, 99% of the people won't understand what on earth is being spoken of when you start mentioning all of, the, of this nonsense. And that's why the people of Kalam, they say themselves, like Al-Ghazali and Fakhruddin al-Razi and other people, they say that if we were to start speaking to the average common person with this language that we write in our books and we start saying to them, Allah is not a body, he is not an accident, he is not an event, he is not in the universe, he is not outside the universe, he is not above, he is not below, he is not in a place, he is not in this. If we came to the people and started using this language, 99, 999 out of every thousand would become atheists. They wouldn't accept a Lord and a Creator who's described in this way. This you find written by Al-Ghazali in one of his books. You find Ar-Razi saying the same thing. So the point being here is that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was not from the people of Kalam. He was not from the people of Kalam. And those who ascribe to him, who come after him, who came centuries after him from the Maturidis, then they... You know, they, they, they ascribe things to him which he is free and in, innocent of and which can never be found in any of, you know, that which is narrated from him or that which he that, that which he's claimed to have written. So anyway, moving on from this, we see uh, Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan. So we're speaking about the comments of the scholars about Abu Hanifa. Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, he says that Abu Hanifa, when he was asked about Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about asking mercy about uh, asking for Allah's mercy upon Abu Hanifa he said rahmatun wasi'atun that we ask for a vast amount of mercy upon Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and may Allah pardon him he is our imam huwa imamuna wa qudwatuna whoever is pleased with this then he is pleased and whoever is angry with this let him be angry yes that we ask for mercy upon Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and we see in another place Sheikh Al-Fawzan he says about Abu Hanifa, he says, Abu Hanifa says, إِذَا جَاءَ الْقَوْلُ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ فَعَلَى الرَّأْسِ وَالْعَيْنِ وَإِذَا جَاءَ عَنِ السَّحَابَةِ فَعَلَى الرَّأْسِ وَالْعَيْنِ وَإِذَا جَاءَ عَنِ التَّابِئِينَ فَنَحْنُ رِجَالُ وَهُمْ رِجَالُ So, Shaykh Al-Fuzan, he quotes this, he says, that Abu Hanifa said, when a statement comes from the Messenger of Allah, صلى الله عليه وسلم, then we should be, then we should be you know, uh, standing to attention. And when a statement comes from the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, then again we should stand to, stand to attention. And when a statement comes from the Tabi'een, then they are men and we are men. And the reason why he said this, the reason why Abu Hanifa said this, is because his knowledge was taken from the Tabi'een. He was a contemporary of the Tabi'een. As the Shaykh says, لِأَنَّهُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ كَانَ مِنْ أَتْبَاءِ التَّابِئِينَ وتتلمذ على التابعين فأبو حنيفة هو أقدم الأئمة أئمة الأربعة. so he said this is because he رحمه الله تعالى he was from the followers of the tabi'een he took knowledge from the tabi'een and he is from the one the foremost amongst the أئمة from the from the great uh, imams and likewise we have a statement here from uh, from Sheikh Zaid bin Hadi al-Madkhalin, he's asked about speaking ill of Abu Hanifa rahimahullahu ta'ala. And he said, it is not to be said that Abu Hanifa is a mubtadi adal, it's not permissible to make the likes of this speech against Abu Hanifa. Rather, he's from the great imams, he's oldest of them in age. However, no one is free from making mistakes, everybody makes mistakes. And anyone who is found with a mistake, whether it be Abu Hanifa or any others, then uh, this is something that no one is free from. None of the messengers, none of the prophets are free. Uh, sorry, no one except the prophets and messengers are free of making mistakes. In other words, everyone besides the prophets and messengers, they make mistakes. And so if anything in his speech, there occurs anything in his speech, then... Uh, then this is to be explained and corrected. But as for speaking ill and using the likes of these words and using you know, this, this uh, criticism, then all of this is, is incorrect. And to warn people from his fiqh, all of this is not correct. He says, هذا 
لا يقوله أهل السنة لليوم ولا قبل اليوم. That Ahlul Sunnah don't say this today, nor even before this day. And then he continues and he says that anyone who makes a mistake from the Imams is not to be reviled. Rather, the mistake is to be made clear by way of evidence uh, from, the, from the Quran and from the Sunnah. And anyone who makes an ijtihad, and he mentions the hadith, anyone who makes an ijtihad, he will receive two rewards. Uh, and, and is correct, he will receive two rewards. And anyone who makes an ijtihad and he's incorrect, he will receive only one, ro- one reward. So this is how we treat the scholars and this is, how we, this is our perception towards them. So from that we see that this is how our scholars, they look towards Abu Hanifa, just as they look towards any of the other Imams, like Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, that all of it, all of it is a, 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 a uniform position. And in fact, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions uh, in one of his statements that none of the four Imams ever deliberately intended to oppose an evidence from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah. This is what Abu, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says in defense of the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam uh, Ahmed, that no one deliberately intended to oppose any evidence from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah. So this shows that any mistakes that they made, there were matters of ijtihad, and those errors are corrected, and mercy is uh, asked, invoked upon them, and they are spoken of you know, with that which is good. So now that we've, we've established Abu Hanifa, his name, his lineage, how he started to seek knowledge, who were his teachers, the early part of his life, uh, when he was involved in uh, argumentation and debating with the different groups and sects, then he turned to fiqh in the religion, getting fiqh from Hamad bin Abi Suleiman, and how he became skilled in that after 20 years. We mentioned some of the statements of praise from the ulama, which recognize him for his fiqh. Now pay attention. The scholars have specialities, and Abu Hanifa became well known and famous for his fiqh. But at the same time, there were other areas in which Abu, Abu Hanifa, where, where there are things mentioned about him. For example, in terms of hadith, we don't see that he narrated a great deal of hadith like the other imams. Like the imams present in his time, like Sufyan al Thawri and Imam al Awza'i and Imam al Zuhri and the great imams of the Salaf who were involved in hadith. So Abu Hanifa's narration of hadith was limited compared to the other great uh, imams. So uh, this is one thing which is mentioned. And the other thing which is mentioned as well that we alluded to earlier on is that in some aspects of belief, in fact, in the issue of iman specifically, then there was a mistake which the scholars have pointed out, which is the, the mistake with rela- relation to al-irja, in which he expelled actions from, from iman. But aside from those things, he is known and spoken well of for his fiqh, for his understanding and sharpness in understanding the issues related to jurisprudence. This now brings us to look at his creed, his aqidah. And when we speak of the aqidah of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, we have to understand that when we look at the sources from where we take this knowledge about Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, there are some key points that we have to bear in mind. The first point is that in the early second century after Hijra, when the time Abu Hanifa was present, 100 Hijra, 110, 120, in this period, it wasn't a practice for the scholars to start writing books. Start writing books, authoring works on fiqh, on aqidah, on whatever. This wasn't something known in the early part of the second century. Therefore, you will not find any book that is authentically attributable to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. There are many books which are ascribed to him, al fiqh al akbar we'll come to them in a short while, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and numerous other books, but all of them, when you study them and analyze them in terms of the chains of narration and also the contents, you see that, that they cannot be attributed firmly to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. Secondly also is that there are certain people who ascribe to Abu Hanifa from the various innovated sects, from the Mu'tazila. There were many of those who were Mu'tazila, who were taking fiqh from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. There were those who were known as the Karramiyya. Karramiyya were a group in the 3rd century. They were Hanafis. And they were Mujassima. 
and they were they were people of kalam, and again they would uh, they, they they would, they would you know, ascribe things to Abu Hanifa which which he, which he is free of. So when it comes to looking at sources of information for the creed of Abu Hanifa, we find that we have to be careful because there are things which are put in those books which are clearly not from Abu Hanifa. In fact, there is clear evidence, there is clear blatant evidence that there are things in these books which are impossible to have come from Abu Hanifa. I'll give you a couple of examples now, we'll look at them in more detail later on. But let me give you one example. An example in one of the books, uh, which is called uh, Fiqh al-Akbar, is that in this book, there is a, a, a distinction made between the sifat dhatiya and sifat fi'liya. Sifat dhatiya, sifat fi'liya. That Allah has actions, with, Allah has attributes which are permanent attributes, and there are attributes which relate to His actions. Right. So this distinction is made in the in one of the books of Abu Hanifa. This we know is impossible because this distinction only ever became mentioned after the third century Hijra. The reason was because that this was an innovation by Ibn Kullab. Ibn Kullab in the third century after Hijra. So this means that an Ibn Kullab was the one from whom the Maturidis and the Ash'aris they took their Aqidah from. So it's clear that someone who came afterwards who was following the way of Ibn Kullab and, and uh, Al-Maturidi, they took this and they put it into those books and ascribed it to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. Let me give you a second clear example and a second clear proof. In one of these books, it is stated by Abu Hanifa, in fact I have the, some of the text here, it says in one of these uh, books, he says here, with respect to the Qur'an and the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَفْظُنَا, ولفظنا بِالْقُرْآنِ مَخْلُوقٌ وَلَفْظُنَا بِالْقُرْآنِ مَخْلُوقٌ That our expression of the Qur'an, our utterance of the Qur'an is created. Now this is impossible because we know that this issue never ever was raised up until after around 232 Hijrah. We know this as a matter of historical fact. This is because when Imam Ahmad was put to trial between, you know, for a long number of years, and especially uh, between 225 Hijra and 232 Hijra, the, the trials of Imam Ahmad. In that period, this was the period where he refuted the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila, and he demolished them, Allah gave him victory, and uh, he defeated their saying that the Qur'an is created. So then the Jahmiya, they came with something new. Like they came with a deception. Instead of saying the Qur'an is created, they said our recitation of the Qur'an is created. Now this is an ambiguous statement. It can mean truth and it can mean falsehood. If you mean that our action, our, our, our voice and our action of reciting is created, then of course it is. This is correct. And if you mean the words which are being recited, which originate from Allah, that they are created, this is false, this is batil. So they use this ambiguous phrase which can mean two things, and they used it as a way to call to their falsehood. Now this only happened after or around 230 Hijra, basically into the, well into the second century after Hijra. So how can Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala be, be saying in the first part of the, first century, of the, uh, of the second century, uh, of the second century, how can he be saying, وَلَفْذُنَا بِالْقُرْآنِ مَخْلُوقٌ This is impossible. It's not possible for anyone, to, for anyone to say this. Likewise, we see in another part in this book, we see that Abu Hanifa says that the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, of dhatiya, which, which, which are, which are dhatiya, they are seven in number. So he mentions seven attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he mentions life and power and will and hearing and seeing and speech and knowledge. These seven attributes are the attributes that were brought by Ibn Kullab. Ibn Kullab from the third century, sorry, in the third century, three, uh, 240, 240 he died. And this was what, whom the Ash'aris and the Maturidis took their creed from. 
<coughs> when Ibn Qulab, when he mentioned these, these seven attributes, this was unknown in the second, in, in the second century after Hijra. It was unknown for anyone to restrict and limit the, the attributes of Allah <coughs> to only seven in number. This is impossible. So these are just three evidences. There are in fact more than three evidences in this book to show that these books which are ascribed to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala al-fiqh al-akbar and the various things that we have to be very careful when we read these books because there are things which are put in these books that are from the later Hanafis and the Maturidis. <coughs> Not only with Abu Hanifa, even with Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari rahimahullah ta'ala even in the books of Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari we see there are forgeries and fabrications which have been put in there by later Hanafis and Maturidis. I'll give you one quick example, or one or two examples with the book Al-Ibana of Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari. In the book Al-Ibana, there is, there is a statement in which Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari, he's speaking about Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala in Al-Ibana. And he's, he is defending Abu Hanifa from the claim that he, that he claimed that the Qur'an is created. And in there he uses a word, he says, he uses the word, Al-Imam Al-A'zam. Al-Imam Al-A'zam. He says, free is Imam Al-A'zam of this claim. Now, you have to ask yourself a question, this word Imam Al-A'zam, this word Imam Al-A'zam to refer to Abu Hanifa, this is an invention of the later Hanafis who began to use this word. It was unknown in that time that Abu Hanifa was known as the Imam Al-A'zam. But what we find from this, this is an evidence that someone has inserted this into the text of uh, Al-Ibana. In fact, there are other evidences uh, as well that some of the Mu'tazila and some of the Ash'aris, they've been playing with the, with, with the book Al-Ibana to ascribe to Al-Ash'ari that which he is free of. So the point that we are making here, my brothers and sisters, that if it is possible for people, this is the point that Ibn Taymiyyah makes, he says, if it is possible for a people to ascribe themselves to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and yet the Prophet is innocent of them, or of the things which they ascribe to him, then how can we not accept that the Imams, the four Imams, that there should be people who ascribe themselves to those Imams, and they attribute things to those Imams, which those Imams are free and innocent of. And in fact, we find that with each one of these Imams, we find with uh, Abu Hanifa, there are people ascribing to him and attributing things to him, which he's free of. And likewise with Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. And likewise with Imam Ahmed, there were Hanbalis who ascribed themselves to Imam Ahmed two centuries afterwards, and they said things about Imam Ahmed, Imam Ahmed which Imam Ahmed is free of. For example, Abu Ya'la. Abu Ya'la is one of those, one of those uh, scholars. He's a Hanbali scholar who was from the 5th century. He died 458 Hijra. Likewise, Rizqullah al-Tamimi. There was a group of fam there was a family called the Tamimi family. Rizqullah al-Tamimi. These scholars, they were taking knowledge from the Ash'aris in Baghdad, in 5th century Baghdad, two centuries after Imam Ahmad. And then they began to take some of this Ilmul Kalam. And then they began to ascribe to Imam Ahmad things which he was free of, language which he never used about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not a jism, Allah is not an arad. They began to ascribe this language to Imam, Imam Ahmad is free of this. And none of this language was known or was it heard from Imam Ahmad himself, nor from any of the direct students of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala. So the point that we are making here is that when, when we come to look at the creed of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, we have to t take extra caution because there are things ascribed to him which he is free and in innocent of. And he wasn't the only imam, there are other imams who also, uh, you know, where things were ascribed to them that he is free and innocent of. So, our point is that if you were to look at each of these four imams and the direct students, the direct students, for example, Abu Hanifa and his direct students, who are his direct students? Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala, Muhammad bin al-Hasan al-Shaybani rahimahullah ta'ala. Likewise, the students of Imam Malik, 
from Imam Malik, his students are Imam Shafi'i, and likewise many others, Waqib bin al-Jarrah, and others. Likewise, the students of Imam Shafi'i, Imam al-Muzani, and others, Abdullah bin Zubair al-Humaydi, and likewise the direct students of Imam Ahmad, Abu Bakr al-Khallal, Abu Zur'at al-Razi. When we go back and look at the Imams and the direct students, we see that all of them are upon uh, 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 the same creed, and they are free from ilm al-kalam. So anyway, we want to read from some of the statements of Aqeedah from Abu Hanifa, uh, ta'ala. So first of all, what is said about him by Imam al-Tahawi, Imam al-Tahawi in his creed, he begins by saying, نَقُولُ فِي تَوْهِيدِ اللَّهِ فِي تَوْهِيدِ اللَّهِ مُعْتَكِدِينَ بِتَوْفِيكِ اللَّهِ That we say about the Tawheed of Allah, believing by the success of Allah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاحِدٌ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ Indeed, Allah is one, He has no partners. وَلَا شَيْءَ مِثْلَهُ There is nothing which is, وَلَا شَيْءَ مِثْلُهُ There is nothing like Him. وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ There is nothing that can, that, that can, that, you know, there's nothing that makes Him incapable, meaning He's all-powerful. وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُهُ And there is no ilah besides Him. In the opening statement here, we have the three affairs of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, wa la ilaha ghayruhu, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, wa la shay'a yu'jizuhu, and the Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat, wa la shay'a mithluhu, there's nothing which is like him. Likewise, we see Abu Hanifa saying that it is not desirable, la yanbaghi li ahadin an yadu'u allaha illa bihi. It's not desirable for anyone to call upon Allah except by him, by, by him, except by Allah alone. Meaning, do not call upon Allah through other people. And he explains this and expands upon this in another, in another work in the Sharh of Al Fiqh Al Akbar. He says, Yukrah an yakul al da'i as'aluka bi haqqi fulanin aw bi haqqi anbiya'ik wa rusulik wa bi haqqi al bayt al haram wa al mash'ar al haram. Abu Hanifa is saying, it is disliked for the one who makes dua to say to Allah, O oh Allah, I ask you by the right of so-and-so, or by the right of so-and-so, or by the right of your prophets, or by the right of your messengers, or by the right of this house, the, the, the sacred house. So here we see that amongst the uh, Abu Hanifa himself and amongst the, the early Hanifis, it is disliked to invoke Allah by way of this innovated form of what they call this, this tawassal. Rather we see Abu Hanifa saying that a person should call upon Allah by way of Allah himself and his names and so on and so forth. And then we see as it relates to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Abu Hanifa says as is related in, in Al-Fiqh Al-Absat, now we know that these are correct and true because that when we look at all of the other imams of the salaf, we see, that, we see that they are agreed upon these issues. So there are things that we can take out from the books which are ascribed to Abu Hanifa, which we know they are correct because we, are find, we find all of the Salaf are united and agreed upon that. So we can take that with acceptance. So he says, لا يوسف الله تعالى بصفات المخلوقين وهو يغضب ويرضى ولا يقال غضبه أقوبته ورداه ثوابه ونصفه كما وصف نفسه أحد لم يلد ولم يلد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد. So he says here in this passage, we do not describe Allah with any of the attributes of the creation. We don't describe Allah with anything that the creation is described with. And then he says, and his anger and his pleasure are two attributes from his attributes. Now this is a refutation of the Maturidis. And the Ash'ari who ascribed to Abu Hanifa, because on the one hand he said, we do, not dis- we do not describe Allah with the attributes of the creation, meaning we don't ascribe to Allah the likeness of the attributes of the creation. Then he said, as for his anger and his pleasure, then they are two attributes from his attributes, bila kayf, without asking how. And it is the statement of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, wa huwa qawlu Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, wa huwa yaghdab wa yarda. And he becomes angry, and he becomes pleased. And in fact, this is what Imam al-Tahawi says in his creed as well. وَهُوَ يَغْضَبُ وَيَرْضَى بِلَا كَيْف without, without asking how. And then he continues that we describe Allah with what he described himself. And then he says, 
he quotes uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas and then he says, Hayyun, Qadirun, Sami'un, Basirun, Alimun, that he is all living, powerful, hearing, seeing, knowing. Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. Laysat ka aydi khalqihi wa wajhihi laysa ka wujuhi khalqihi. So he says that the hand of Allah is above their hands and it is not like the hands of his creation. And his face is not like the, the faces of his creation. He will see clearly in this and other statements, uh, in fact in another part in Fiqh al-Akbar he says, وَلَهُ يَدٌ وَوَجْهٌ وَنَفْسٌ كَمَا ذَكَرَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي الْقُرْآنِ فَمَا ذَكَرَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي الْقُرْآنِ مِن ذِكْرِ الْوَجْهِ وَالْيَدِ وَنَفْسِ فَهُوَ لَهُ صِفَاتٌ بِلَا كَيْفِ وَلَا يُقَالْ إِنَّ يَدَهُ قُدْرَتُهُ أَوْ نِعْمَتُهُ لِأَنَّ فِيهِ إِبْطَالُ الصِّفَةِ وَهُوَ قَوْلُ أَهْلِ الْقَدَرِ وَالْإِعْتِزَالِ This is in Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar. He says that Allah, He has a, a hand and a face and a self, and a self. Just as Allah has mentioned in the Quran. So whatever he has mentioned in the Quran of a face and hand and self, then it is an attribute for him, bila kayf, without specifying how or without asking how. And it is not to be said, wala yuqal, that his hand is his power. Nor is it said that it is his favor. Because in this is, an, uh, is a rejection, an invalidation of the attribute. Rather it is the saying of the people of Qadr and I'tizal. This is a great statement here because it is a refutation of those who ascribe to Abu Hanifa from the Ashair and the Maturidiyah. Because here Abu Hanifa is affirming what we call the Sifat Khabariya. The Sifat Khabariya are those attributes that we can only know of by way of Allah informing us that He, have those, that, that he has those attributes. And from those are the attribute of hand and face and eye and the self. And so here we see that Abu Hanifa is clearly establishing these attributes upon the way of the Salaf. That we affirm them, bila kayf, without asking how. And then at the same time, he is refuting the ta'wil, the ta'wils of the Mu'tazila. Because the Mu'tazila were the ones who, when they began to deny the names and attributes, they began to invent explanations to explain away the verses in the Quran. So here he's refuting the ta'wil of hand to power and, and other things like this. These ta'wils are the ones that the, one, the, 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 the Ash'aris and the Maturidis who came afterwards, they began to use these ta'wils because they followed the way of the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya and they abandoned the way of Abu Hanifa rahim ta'ala, as is very clear from these statements. Likewise, we see in, uh, uh, in another, uh, in the same Fiqh al-Akbar, uh, in, in, in the same sources, we see that Abu Hanifa was asked about an-nuzul, an-nuzul al-ilahi, about the descent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, Yanzilu bila kayf. Yanzilu bila kayf. That he descends without asking how. That he descends without asking how. And we see uh, that Al Kothari, you know, this man called Al Kothari, Muhammad bin Zahid Al Kothari, he is one of these Dajjals from the previous century, is a great liar, and he's a Maturidi Hanafi. He is the one who actually did a verification of this book from where this statement of Abu Hanifa is quoted from. Yanzilu bila kayf. That he affirms that Allah descends without asking how. Al Kothari, he never made any remark about this. He kept silent. He never said anything about this, about this statement of Abu Hanifa. In fact, there are numerous statements about which he kept silent. Why? Because there's no answer to this. How, how are you going to attack Abu Hanifa? You're attacking. All the other, the, the, you're attacking some of the imams of the Salaf, you're attacking the Hanbalis, you're attacking the, uh, some of the, the followers of Imam Shafi'i. Why? Because they affirm these attributes of an Nuzul and Istiwa, and you are speaking ill of them. You are speaking ill of Abu, uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim with, with evil words. But how come you're not speaking ill of Abu Hanifa when he affirms the Sifat Khabariya, when he affirms Yanzilu Bila Kayf? And in this book that, that you are verifying yourself, you haven't mentioned, you haven't even made a comment about this, no comment at all. Uh, this shows, this shows the, 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 the contradiction and the tanaqud in those who ascribe themselves to Abu Hanifa, and they, you know, they don't have any 
uh, consistent uh, position when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, we see from Abu Hanifa uh, the statement, and in fact there are many statements, uh, he says, uh, as an example, uh, a statement about the, uh, the Qur'an, just bring an example from here. He says about the Quran, a statement about the Quran. He says, Wal Quranu Kalamullah Ta'ala. The Quran is the speech of Allah the Most High. Fil Masahif, Maktub, wa fil Qulub, Mahfud, wa ala al Alsun, Makrur. That the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is written in the Masahif, it is preserved in the hearts, and it is recited on the tongues. And he says, Wal Quran, Wal Quran, Ghayru Makhluk. So, this is again Abu Hanifa opposing the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila, and he affirms that the Quran is not created. This again is different to those who came after him from the Hanafis, from the Maturidis, and they believe the Quran that we have present with us, the Quran that we recite, the Quran that we us, they say that this Quran is created. They say that this Qur'an is created. They say that what, that which we see in the Mus'haf, it is the created uh, Arabic Qur'an, which cannot be the speech of Allah. And they say the speech of Allah is only the meaning, the kalam nafsi in the self of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This again was unknown to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullahu ta'ala. Also we see that Abu Hanifa establishes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is above the heavens, above His throne. He says, "Man qala la a'rifu Rabbi fi al-samaa' am fi al-ard, fakad kafar. Wa kada man qala innahu ala al-arsh, wa la adri al-arsh af al-samaa' am fi al-ard." Whoever says, "I don't know whether, I don't know whether my Lord is in the heavens or in the earth," he says, "This person has disbelieved." And likewise, the one who says, "Oh yes, I believe Allah is upon the arsh, upon the throne, but I don't know whether the throne." is in the heavens or in the earth. So in other words, the person is playing ignorant. So he says, Abu Hanifa says, whoever says either of these two statements, then he has disbelieved. He has disbelieved. So here we see that Abu Hanifa, like all of the imams of the Salaf in that time, they affirm that Allah is above the throne, above the heavens. This was the time in the early second century when uh, the uh, imams like Imam Zuhri, Ayub as Akhtiyani, and other than them, uh, Hamad bin Zayd, they were refuting the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila when the Mu'tazila, when they first began to say, Allah is not above the throne. Allah is not above the seven heavens. This is kufr. These imams were speaking against these Jahmiya. And we see here Abu Hanifa speaking with the same thing in agreement with those imams. Again, you see that those who ascribe to Abu Hanifa, they are not upon this creed. They say that to say Allah is above means he is in a direction. And to say he is in a direction means he is in a place. And to say that he is in a place means that he is enclosed by space. And to say that he is enclosed by space means that he is a body. And to say he is a body, this is kufr. Where has all of this come from? It has come from the mind, the aql of Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. And then it came to the Jahmiya, then the Mu'tazila, then it was followed by the Ash'aris and Maturidis. And then they tried to ascribe this to Abu Hanifa, and Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah, he's free and innocent of any of this type of, of this type of speech. So these are uh, some more statements he said about Allah's speech. قَدْ كَانَ مُتَكَلِّمًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ كَلَّمَ مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ قَدْ كَانَ مُتَكَلِّمًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ كَلَّمَ مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one who was, who was, was, the one who spoke. That he is one who has speech. And he was one who spoke before he actually spoke to Musa alayhi salam. Now, what is the evidence in this? The evidence in this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was eternally one who speaks. Allah has always been one who, is one who speaks. And he was one who spoke before he even spoke to Musa alayhi salam. Now, this statement here is a refutation of another group of people called the Karramiyyah. The Karramiyyah who came in the 3rd century, they were Hanafis, and they claimed and they believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't always have his attributes. 
This is batil. They said that Allah was not eternally one who had speech and qudra. Rather, there was a point when Allah became one who speaks and one who has power. And this is batil. This is false. This is batil. This goes against our creed. But these were a group of Hanafis who ascribed to Abu Hanifa and they made this mistake. Rather, we say that Allah is eternally one who speaks. He's always been one who has speech and one, who's, one who speaks. And then he spoke to Musa when he willed. He spoke to Adam al-Islam when he willed. He spoke to Muhammad when he, when he willed. Because Allah is one who speaks and who chooses to speak by way of his will. So here Abu Hanifa, when he says, قَدْ كَانَ مُتَكَلِّمًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ كَلَّمَ مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السلام. He is affirming a statement that Imam Ahmed said more than you know, a hundred and something years afterwards. Imam Ahmed said, لَمْ يَزِلْ مُتَكَلِّمًا إِذَا شَاء That Allah has never ceased to be one who speaks when he wills. This was a refutation of the ones who said the Qur'an is created. And Abu Hanifa said the same thing. So, Ya Ikhwan, the point from all of this, we've given examples of Allah's names and attributes. The point they are, that we are making from all of this is that when you look at the creed of Abu Hanifa rahimahullahu ta'ala, when it comes to the tawheed of Allah and the names and attributes of Allah and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in other affairs, we find that overwhelmingly, except on the issue of al-iman, we see that it agrees with the creed of all of the imams of the salaf. And in fact, there are some very specific things in the creed of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, rahimahullah, which shows that he is innocent. He is free of those who came afterwards, two centuries afterwards, and who ascribed to Abu Hanifa, and who instead, they took the way of the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila in following Ilmul Kalam and founding their religion upon ilmul kalam, and denying some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and saying that the Qur'an that we have with us is created. And they fell into all of these things, agreeing with the Jahmi and the Mu'tazila. Whereas we see Abu Hanifa rahimahu ta'ala, he was someone who was not upon that, and he refuted that which they were upon, that which they, that which they spoke with, and that which they were upon. So this concludes our discussion about the creed, of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and we want to finish off just by summarizing everything that we've mentioned so far so we started by mentioning the importance of understanding the history especially in the early first century of Islam and the second century of Islam in which Abu Hanifa was born we mentioned that uh, we mentioned his lineage we mentioned his grandfather and how his grandfather came into Islam. And then we mentioned that as a child, he would uh, uh, take on the trade of his father, would go to the market as a, as a silk trader. And then he met a Sha'bi, and a Sha'bi directed him towards seeking knowledge. So then he began to seek knowledge. And then in the early part of his life, he was involved much, with much debating and arguing with the Rafida, with the, uh, the atheists, and with other than them. And then he attended to fiqh. When he realized that he didn't really have knowledge of fiqh, he then started acquiring knowledge of fiqh. And he took that from his teacher, Hamad bin Zaid, for 18, 20 years. And he became skilled and he became famous and known for being a faqih. And he was praised greatly by all of the scholars for having a great level of fiqh. Until even in this day of ours, we see our scholars, Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan and Sheikh Zaid al-Madkhli, and all the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, they praise Abu Hanifa for, for his fiqh. And we said after this that uh, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, we mentioned things about his, uh, the, 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 the arguments and debates with the Jahmi, with Jahm bin Safwan and the Sumaniyya. Then we mentioned some of the books that are ascribed to him which are not really established. Fiqhul Akbar, you know, many books which are ascribed to him but they don't really belong to him. And we also mentioned some of the affairs of belief from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala which agrees with the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So from all of this, the lesson that we are taking overall from this is that if you ascribe yourself to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, then the first thing that you should establish is what was his creed, what was his belief. Was his creed in the Tawheed of Allah, in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
Was it in agreement with the rest of the Salaf or was it in disagreement? And we've proven that it is in agreement with the rest of the Salaf. And if you are holding a creed, if you are saying, if you are saying the hand of Allah means the qudra of Allah, and your Imam is saying right here, لا يقال إن يده قدرته أو نعمته Then you have to ask yourself, are you really truly following the Imam? Are you following him in fiqh only or in aqidah as well? And likewise, when this Imam says, وَهُوَ يَغْضَبُ وَيَرْضَى That he becomes angry and pleased. And it is not to be said, وَلَا يُقَالْ It is not said, his anger is his punishment, and his pleasure is his reward. I mean, make, making ta'wil. Then who are you really following? Are you following this Imam? Or are you following someone else, the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila? So this is the important lesson that we take, Ya Ikhwani Fillah, with respect to this Imam. This is only a small glimpse of what we can mention in the given time. So with that we conclude our lesson. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I'll just mention very quickly some of the books which are ascribed to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. The first book is Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, which is narrated by way of his son, Hamad, Hamad bin Abi Hanifa. This book, when you analyze all of the chains of narration, this book is not established as being the work of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. Plus there are many things that we pointed out which simply never existed in the second century, they only existed in the third century. This is another historical proof that it's not established to Abu Hanifa. Second book is Al Fiqh Al Akbar by a person called Abu Muti Al Balkhi. Abu Muti Al Balkhi. This again, when you analyze all of the chains of narration, you find that there are people who are not acceptable in the chains of narration. And this man, Abu Muti Al Balkhi, he himself was a Jahmi. He himself was a denier of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so some of these people would write things into these books that are not really from Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. That's the second book also, Al-Alim Wal-Muta'allim. Al-Alim Wal-Muta'allim. Uh, this again is a fabricated book against Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. There's no proof by way of isnad that it belongs to Abu Hanifa. Likewise, there is a Risala, Risalatul Imam Abi Hanifa ila Uthman al-Batti. And again, if you look at the chain of narration, they are majahil, they are unknown people who are, who are in this chain of narration. And finally, al-wasiyyah, al-wasiyyah, which is ascribed through the root of uh, Abu Yusuf. Again, they are majahil, they are unknown people in the chain of narration in this book. Now these five books are the most famous books which have been ascribed to Abu Hanifa, ta'ala, but none of them are established as being the actual work of Abu Hanifa, ta'ala. So what we gather from all of this is that these people were obviously narrating things from Abu Hanifa in which there is an element of truth because clearly in some of the statements you've heard earlier on these are statements which are in agreement with what the Salaf were upon, what the Sahaba were upon. So those elements we know that they are true. But there are many other things that you can clearly see that there is the influence of Kalam coming in and these people ascribing to Abu Hanifa that which, which is not actually from him. Likewise, there was a grandson of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala called Ismail bin Hamad bin Abi Hanifa. This grandson of Abu, Abu, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, he was a hardcore Jahmi. He was a hardcore Jahmi. And he was someone who was involved in the trial, uh, the, the trial of the creation of the Quran. He would, uh, you know, the, 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 with respect to Ma'moon, and the scholars who came, he was involved in that fitna, you know, in, in supporting the, the rulers against the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah. So, so this Ismail used to ascribe to his grandfather, to Abu Hanifa, that to say the Quran is created is my religion and the religion of my forefathers. So he used to spread lies against Abu Hanifa, rahimahullahu ta'ala. So all of these things, that's why I said to you the, uh, earlier on that when we look at Abu Hanifa in particular, we have to understand the circumstances and the history 
of the second century after Hijrah to understand and to try to make sense and to try to decipher many of the things which are said and ascribed to Abu Hanifa which he, which he is free and innocent of. And also because many groups they ascribe to Abu Hanifa, the Mu'tazila, the Mu'tazila they ascribe to Abu Hanifa. The Qarramiyya Mujassima they ascribe to Abu Hanifa. That even amongst them the Rafida, as Ibn Taymiyyah points out in Minhaj Sunnah, that there are those who ascribe to, who ascribe to Abu Hanifa. So with all of this, we should understand that there is not a single book that is firmly ascribable or established as having been written by Abu Hanifa rahimahullahu ta'ala in terms of Isnad. And even those which are, we can see clearly there are issues and problems uh, in those works and in those books. Uh, time is now for Salatul Maghrib, inshallah ta'ala, so we'll uh, break here. So if anybody wants to need, needs to do wudu to prepare for the Salah. After the Salah, at, uh, more or less after the Salah, maybe 10-15 minutes after the Salah, will be the next talk, inshallah ta'ala, by our brother Abu Mu'adh Taqweem. And this talk, the title of the talk, I don't have it with me, what's the title of the talk, anyone? If you can remember. Yeah, the, the next uh, talk is the way of the prophets in giving da'wah. How did the prophets give da'wah? How did they call the people to Islam, to Tawheed? So that's the next talk at about 440, 440-ish, inshallah ta'ala, 445, inshallah ta'ala. Make sure you attend this lesson. It's a very important, crucial lesson because it tells you, we learn from it, what should our methodology be when we call the non-Muslims to Islam? in our time, in our age and era. So with that, uh, we conclude. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi sahbihi ajma'in. Establish. We'll pray with this one.